Good afternoon, everyone. We are so glad you are here. Uh, my name is Connor Duncan, and I am the Director of Community Partnerships at Kensington Park Senior Living in Kensington, Maryland. And on behalf of Kensington Senior Living, we welcome you and we're so glad you're here today sharing your time with us. A Kensington Senior Living offers independent living, assisted living, and three levels of memory care across the DC metro region. Our promise is to love and care for your family as we do our own. I'm proud to introduce my colleague, Susan Garvey, who is the Director of Community Outreach at the Kensington Reston, which is set to open in early 2021. Hi, Susan. Hi, Connor, and thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I've just joined the Kensington Reston Senior Living Community as the Director of Community Outreach. I'm very excited to be here. Now, my husband, Tom, and I have been talking about downsizing and decluttering for a number of years now after living in our home for 23 years. So I'm really looking forward to Matt's presentation. Now, before we start, we have a few housekeeping rules to share. We really want this discussion to be interactive, so we encourage you to participate by asking questions or making comments. We just ask that you mute yourself when you're not speaking. Now, if you'd like to connect with other attendees, please feel free to use the chat button and leave your contact information for both the presenters and the audience. Also, we've allowed about 45 minutes for this discussion, but Matt has graciously said he's willing to stay over a little for sure, so that we can get all your questions and answers in if needed. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kitty Janning. Hi, I'm Kitty Janney, the Director of Community Outreach at the Kensington Falls Church. And be, on behalf of the Kensington Senior Living Community, we're thrilled to have Matt Paxson join us today. Matt is best known as a downsizing and cleaning expert, television host, a speaker, author, radio personality, and host of the current TV show Legacy List with Matt Paxton. Matt will be sharing tips on decluttering, downsizing, ways of letting go of tangible items, and I hope share about his personal journey along the way. Personally, I've heard Matt speak several times, and I always learn something new. So I'm excited to have Matt take it from here. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank everybody for coming. I, can everybody hear me? Somebody put in the chat that they can hear me just to make sure we know that you can. I'm gonna, there we go. Somebody says they can hear me. Okay, cool. All right, yay. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I'm gonna start this presentation. Um, I should tell you, I hope, I am actually in the middle of downsizing. Uh, I am moving myself and it is not easy. This is really hard. <laughs> I've been talking about it for 20 years, but I hadn't moved the entire time. And, uh, and now I'm personally moving and it's, it's really emotional. And so it's funny, the, um, we'll, I'll show you a little clip on the TV show, but I'll also go through some tips today. And it's really easy to put on paper, but when you sit down and you're going through your parents' stuff and you're going through your grandparents' stuff and you're going through your own stuff and you only got space for like 20% of it, man, it's a lot harder than people think. And so I, I always thought I knew where you were <laughs> and I feel like I'm one of the national experts on it, but man, I really didn't get it until I started going through it myself. So this is, uh, the, the change is scary. So we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, I think Connor is going to moderate the questions for me. So if you have questions as we're going, that's cool. Go ahead and put them in chat. And if they're appropriate for the, the right time, we'll, we'll stop and ask them. And if not, we're gonna jump in and uh, we'll answer them all at the end. But I will stick around to answer as many questions as I can. All right, if you see this guy on the screen, that is King Tut. Uh, I always put King Tut on there because um, there's only one person that took all the stuff with him when he died. It's King Tut. And uh, we're all paying a lot of money to go see it. I don't think most of us, I don't think most of our stuff is going to go into, uh, I don't think most of it will go into a museum. All right. So let's go through. I've got, a, I have, good, I can see the chats now too. I can get back into this. Sorry for technology. Okay. I think you know who I am. If you haven't seen me on the TV show Hoarders, um, we are not here to talk about hoarding. Um, we're here to just talk about stuff. You know, I started focusing on downsizing about six years ago, 
um, honestly, most of my clients aren't hoarders. They've just lived in their house for 30, 40, 50 years. And I think a lot of people on this today have lived at least 10 years. So it takes a while. You know, it takes a while to fill the house. And so it's not necessarily hoarding. It's just that we have a lot of stuff. And we have a lot of memories attached to it. My new show is called Legacy List uh, with Matt Paxson. And what a legacy list is, is a list of items people always give me. They, you know, there's four or five items in the house that really matter. It's, it's usually not a lot. And you say, if you know, my house burned down, these are the items I got to have. And a lot of times they've misplaced a few of them. And it's almost always a wedding ring. Almost everybody says, yeah, yeah, I've dropped my wedding ring somewhere. I don't know where it's somewhere in the house. Can you find it? And believe it or not, we normally do. Um, but that the show follows a family that we go help downsize. This year, it's been a little different because people aren't necessarily moving. They're just starting to downsize. They're getting, they're not necessarily moving today, but they're, they're like two years ahead. And so they're getting started. So a lot of more, this season two is going to be a lot of people just like you that are watching where you're, you've decided to make a move, but man, you don't know where to start. And so this season two is interesting because we've got some really fascinating houses and the families ask us to find a few interesting things. Um, hello, Temple. Sorry, my son is going to jump in here a lot. Hey, buddy, I'm on a big presentation. You got to go in the other room, okay? Hello. Nope, you got to go. I love you. You got to go. Hi, bye, love you. Bye. No. It is my sixth one. Okay, go. Bye. Bye. Sorry, everybody. You got to go, dude. I am in the presentation. Thank you. That is one of my three children. Sorry, everybody. He's the youngest. He's six years old. His name is Temple. All right. So let's do, I think a lot of us do, I say, uh, and someone just, um, yeah, uh, Mr. Jameson, you can have him. He is, he is, a, he is a handful, six year old. Um, I put in here that the most important museum in the world is in your family's home. I really believe that. And what that means is there, you know, you don't have to have rich stuff. Um, the, the financial value I've owned really doesn't matter. It's about the story. And, and all, every one of our houses, if you have anything from your parents' life, it's usually pretty interesting. Um, I will say this though, I was I found uh, in a house, I was looking for a Picasso. The family knew there was a Picasso in the house. Not all of us have a Picasso in their house. Um, this is kind of a spoiler alert. Uh, we found two Salvador Dali's in the same pile in the attic. The guy had no idea these Salvador Dali's were in the house. So sometimes you actually find amazing uh, art in history. And sometimes you just find a really good story. Either way, it's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to show you like a one minute uh, preview of this. Oh, I'll say this real quick. The goal of the show was to, to really help people get started downsizing just in the process you are. There's not a whole lot of shows with our age group that are going through really important stuff. And so I wanted to show that it could be done positively. Most networks wanted us to say, was there an attractive granddaughter we could put on the show or the family's going to fight over something? And I was like, no, <laughs> none of that. We're just here to tell the interesting stories that exist. Um, what did we learn? You definitely don't have to be rich to have amazing stories. Um, this is the number one thing I learned. There is a strong female behind every family legacy. And it's typically two or three generations back. And that woman managed the family legacy and managed the family story and passed it down generation to generation. That has been, and so you know, when we started, it was like, I wonder who did this? And now I go right at it. Who was the lady in your family that, that created everything? And everyone always knows. Um, People would just have too much stuff, to be honest. That's the other thing we learned. Uh, and you've got to tell your stories. Telling your stories is the most important part. You're going to hear me say that a hundred times today. All right, here is a quick video of our show. In season one, we traveled the country visiting one inspiring home after another. Oh my gosh. She's going to love that. Oh. Along the way, we met incredible people who needed our help downsizing and moving out of their homes stuff everywhere that I just don't know what to do with. How did you do this? We learned that every family has items that tell their history and define their legacy. I've never seen that. That is cool looking. Oh. This is living history. This is what we're here to find. Wow. This is awesome. And now in season two, our journey continues. Six generations of stuff in the house. Nobody threw anything out. New families, <laughs> new items, and even more fascinating stories. How did you feel when you realized that there were enslaved people here? I guess a little ashamed, not knowing what to do with that knowledge. Yeah. It's hurtful. Like, it's not my values. This season, we continue to help families downsize and prepare for their future. I mean, this is 
I've never seen anything like this, have you? Find a home, find a historical society who would value this stuff. It's not just part of my story, it's part of their story too. As we uncover the amazing history of their past. There he is. You asked us to find this bracelet. Wow, yeah, this is so amazing. Every family has a story. His dad served on the first mixed crew. That is history. Sometimes they just need a little help finding it. Yeah, a single shot musket. This is a button. No kidding. Found this Whoa. in your family's old jewelry box. Oh my. My mom sent this to my dad. Thank you. I haven't seen this in a really long time. This is a real legacy. It really is. All right, so we got eight new episodes coming. Um, I really get excited about that, uh, even just seeing that. Because um, I've spent the last 20 years helping people downsize, and finally we're getting to tell these stories. All right, you guys ready for some tips, hopefully. All right, what is the hardest part about downsizing? And I love this. Um, if you've seen me give this presentation before, um, this guy on the screen right now is saying, hey, one day this will all be yours and the next generation is hearing one day this is all going to be mine right? a lot of times we have to hear nobody wants your stuff right the fantasy is when we die they're going to have a big party in our dining room they're going to look up there's lace there's charger plates there's crystal there's silver it's all there right how many people actually do this for us now while we're alive? Not as many, right? And it gets lost in translation. For us, our fantasy is that people are gonna be so excited to receive all our stuff. And the reality is they're overwhelmed. They don't know what to do with it, right? And what I've learned here is it's not that people don't want our stuff. They just don't value the same stuff that we like. You and I, our generations were really tightly packed you know, like we were still alive with when our grandparents, sometimes our great grandparents, our grandparents and our parents all were alive. A lot of times multi-generational in the same house. Um, mm -hmm. My mom was 22 when she had me or 24 when she had me. I was 35 when I had my sons. And so the difference is there's a generation missed. All right. There's a whole generation that didn't get born because we're having our cater. And so where for us, we had our family togetherness oftentimes in the dining room, in the home. Well, now the family time is in the Outer Banks or it's in, it's in Maryland, it's up, for you guys, it's up north, it's in Rehoboth, right? Or it's at the Bay, uh, it's on the Potomac. You know, we're going to vacation homes as opposed to doing it in our one home. And so the items that used to be in that one home that we all lived in, it's more spread out now and the kids just don't care as much about those, right? It's really interesting to think that. And so I want to remind people, it's not that they don't want your stuff. They just see the value of you in different items. So the value is placed somewhere else. All right, so let's get into these tips. How do we really start doing this? I'm going to, I'm going to roll through these. Um, definitely ask your questions as you have them, and we'll, we'll answer a lot as we get there to the end. All right, including everyone in the house is really important. A lot of times I feel, and I see either an adult child gets left out on purpose because they're a real pain to deal with, or uh, one of the spouses gets left out because the other spouse just doesn't want to deal with it, right? You've got to include other people. If you do not include them, uh, they're not going to have a say in it, okay? It's really important that they have a say in it. Uh, and the grandkids, I want to say this, um, until before COVID, I always said do not uh, allow the grandkids to financially uh, be rewarded for helping. And I've actually changed on that now. Um, you know, kids, it's gotten crazy. Kids get paid a lot of money to do really not a lot of work. I had a kid the other day want to mow my lawn for $65. Um, I was like, dude, I'll do it for 40. <laughs> you know, that's 40 is a lot of money. 65 is insane. And it got away from it. What I will say is you want the grandkids involved because they need to hear the stories. And so don't be afraid to put a $2 bill on it or put a dollar in there. Um, I've really encouraged people to go back to the $2 bills for some reason. You know, when I was a kid, they were amazing and kids just don't care about cash anymore. A $2 bill is pretty interesting. Get them excited, get them working with you and to spend the whole day with you. Cause it's really about them hearing the stories. 
right? Do not exclude your spouse just because you don't want to deal with them. This is the time. The reason people don't know what to take is because they weren't included in this process. So please include everybody, right? 10 minute sweep. I can't stress this enough. You've got to, to you've got to take it slow, right? If you jump in, it so we asked earlier, how long have you lived in the house? Some of you are at 10 years, some are at 20, some are at 30, some are at 40. Some people are at 50 years in the house. Is it going to take longer than a, than a long weekend to clean it out? Yeah. If it took you 50 years to open it, it to fill it up, it's going to take you more than three days to empty it. So I want to ease into it. I used to run marathons a lot, believe it or not. Um, and you know, you would run one mile the first day. You wouldn't run 26 miles on the first day. You eased into it. And a lot of times I will compare downsizing to losing weight because really that's what it's kind of like, right? But you really don't need, you, you don't want to do it all in one day, right? You've got to ease into it. So I say 10 minutes the first week, 10 minutes a night. That's it. A lot of times they just start when uh, Final Jeopardy is on, when you hear the doo 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 and then you can go all the way till eight o'clock and then you're good to go. 10 minutes. That's it. I like to pick a one foot or two foot area and clean it each night. Right? And then start to ease into a half an hour. Another way to do this is to um, start with a small area, either a shelf in the refrigerator or a, the door of the refrigerator or the junk drawer in your kitchen. Or even a lot of people are just doing, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't start here, but a lot of people will ease in to like the second tier of things is the guest room closet. Cause that's where we keep a lot of our clothes we don't need anymore. Ease into it. If you start off too fast, you're gonna burn out. All right, unpack the bags. This is super, and again, folks, if you got questions, don't be afraid to text or to, to write them here in the chat. We can answer them live. Um, unpack the bags. This is interesting. So many, this is what really keeps your house clean. So many people come into the house and then because where it's hot, you know, I live in Virginia, it gets really, really hot. And I bring the bag in from say Target or Kroger or Publix. I don't know what you guys have up there. Um, but you come in there and it's too hot. And so you just put the bag down on the counter and you sit down and you say, I'll get to it later. Later never happens. You can't get to it later. You have to unpack it. So I have a suitcase here in this picture because a lot of times with suitcases, um, I find that we, we don't unpack right away. I mean, we put that suitcase on the side of the room and say, oh, I'll get to it in a little bit. Or even worse, we have a 90 percenter in our house. I mean, uh, a lot of times, uh, I'll be quite honest, um, every woman I've ever dated was a 90 percenter. You know, and I don't mean to put a, a gender on it, but she literally, they'll, they'll come in there and they'll unpack 90% of the suitcase and then they leave a few more pieces of, of clothes in there. It's like, why don't you just finish it? They're like, oh, I'll get to it later. And what happens is it puts a delay, right? And then we don't get to it. And then something gets put on top of it. And then something gets put on top of it, right? And then all of a sudden that pile is bigger than it was or you can't find what you needed. Emptying these bags, whether it be your, your luggage or your grocery bags or whatever, even when you come back from Walmart or Target, right? If you don't unpack it right away, all you're doing is creating stress in your head. And that stress in your head keeps you from progressing and downsizing. Our, our lives are already super busy. And so it's really important to have every, all the things cleared off our desk. So when we do decide to downsize, we've made new space in our life to downsize. We're not trying to cram it into our already existing lives. Right? Every item has a home. This is important when you're unpacking these bags. These are in order on purpose. When you're unpacking these bags, the items go in a very specific place. I mean, look, the shoes are going where the shoes go. The jackets are hung on the hook. Everything goes exactly where it's supposed to go. Um, for me, clothes go into the closet or into the, to wherever they're supposed to go right, in your house. Books go onto the bookshelf. Tools. Go into the garage. I mean, it's really important that the tools go into the garage. I've seen tools in every room but the garage. This sounds silly, uh, but even make sure the food goes into the pantry. This, I'm even surprised I have to put this rule up here, but people forget this. When you get home, put the items exactly where they're supposed to go. If you put them halfway there, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'll take them upstairs later. Take them straight up. If you leave them on the, on the stairs to get to later, that just junks up your life later. You've got to You've got to then touch it twice. You've got to take it. You forget it. Life happens. You start doing other things. 
If you don't finish it immediately and put the items where it's supposed to go, then it just puts a delay in your life and it builds up and builds up. Um, I also do equal in, equal out is attached here. This is kind of an unpopular one. I push this with close. All right, your house doesn't expand just because something is on sale. Let me say that again. Your closet does not expand just because something is on sale. When your closet is full, it's full. And if you buy new items, you need to get rid of the same amount of items in your garage or in your closet. It's really important when you bring new items in, get rid of the space to make, you know, get rid of the other items to make space for that. That's a very unpopular one. Um, I usually lose a few people on that tip, but equal in, equal out. And yes, I'm talking about shoes. Absolutely, I'm talking about shoes. If you have 50 pair and you buy a 51st pair, get rid of another pair. You don't need 50 pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Four pile sort, when you really start cleaning, I think this is important. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to know where things are going. And there, it's, it's really easy. Keep, sell, donate, trash. Mm -hmm. um, keep is obvious. Sell, donate, and trash. The items are leaving. So this is a new one that I do. I keep, uh, I keep the cell, the donate, and the trash. Those piles are next to my chair okay, where I'm sitting because I want the, the piles next to me that, I can, that I'm going to get rid of the items. So if I'm going to sell it, it goes there. If I'm going to donate it, it goes right in front of me. If I'm going to trash it, it goes to my right. My keep pile, 10 feet across the room. Now why would I do that? I want you to physically have to get up. Okay, I want you to physically have to get up if you are going to actually keep it. You'd be amazed how many family members say, oh, I would never part with this. Not a chance. I'm never going to part with it. And then I'd say, all right, we'll walk it over to that pile. Like, all right, I can donate it. That's fine. I'll donate it. I mean, believe it or not, it's just a way to trick your brain. And if you have to physically get up, then you're going to decide if you really, really want it or not. Okay? I don't have a maybe pile on here, a fifth pile maybe. Um, I used to have it. I've taken it out. I don't think it should be a fifth pile because a lot of us, and it, it, it oftentimes creates issues between the two partners. Um, I, what I like now is I give everybody five maybe tickets, which means uh, if your partner really wants to keep something and you don't want to keep something, then you can give her that maybe ticket or she can use her maybe ticket right? or vice versa. But I give everybody five items in the house that they get to use their maybe coupon. Uh, if you have a, a maybe pile, everything goes into that pile and all you're doing is kicking that uh, can down the road really. So I don't do the pile anymore, I just do the coupons, the maybe coupons. All right, I hope you guys, we're halfway through. I'm, I'm flying through these on purpose. I hope you guys are getting some in, in, information here. Distribute legacy items now. This is an important one. What is a legacy item? It's actually where I got the name for my show. A legacy item is an item that's important to you. In my house growing up, it was the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother saved for the piano during the war. She bought it after the war, she played it. My mother then grew up learning how to play on that piano. My mom went on to be a professional organist. Mm -hmm. Then I learned to play on that piano at my house same piano, and now my son, my eight-year-old son plays on that piano. So we have four generations that play on that piano. Um, as a younger man, I really wanted that piano. And my mom would always say, well, when you die, you're going to get that piano. And when she dies, she, that I would get the piano. And I thought, I, I don't want to wait that long. I was, I'm 45 now. You know, by the time my mom passes away, she's only 72. She's pretty young. I mean, I'm probably going to be in my mid-60s to early 70s. I don't want a piano by then. Hopefully, I don't even have a house when I'm 70. You know, and so I said, let's, let's get this going now. And she was not ready to give me the piano. Um, what happened this year since I wrote this class, it's been really awesome. She has actually decided to move. We live down in Richmond, Virginia. She's moving into a, a community, and an active community, and she has decided to give us the piano. And now my son, my eight-year-old son, is receiving the piano, not me. So she gave the legacy item now while she's alive because she wanted to see my, my son, her grandson, practice on that piano. It turns out it wasn't that she didn't want me to have it. I wasn't actively playing. And so she didn't really want to give it to me because she wanted it to be played every day. It's a piano she's played for 72 years or 70, 65 years. So when she saw that my son was playing, it was a way for her to see that piano being 
used and, and, and brought her happiness and joy. So she was happy to give that away. Don't wait until you're dead. Um, please, please, please let the people do it now. A lot of us, this came up when I gave this class a couple weeks ago. A lot of us just do things the way our parents did. Um, you don't need to feel guilty for doing something the way that your parents did. I'm writing this down because this always comes up. I mean, there's a guilt over 55. In the country right now, we have people over 55 that feel obligated. They have this guilt to do things the way their parents did. I'm 45. I can assure you, we don't care the way our parents did it. We are we're going to do it our way. Um, I owned a very big company for a long time, a downsizing company. I've sold it since. Um, where you know the whole our whole job was we would go in and help people clean out their attics and their basements and move them when uh, when someone passed away or when they moved into senior living. Uh, Twenty years ago, there wouldn't be a company for that because the families did the jobs. The families did it. But now the younger generation, they don't have any interest in doing that and they're happy to hire someone else to help them do that. Um, that's where that guilt line is. Don't be guilted into holding something the old way just because your parents did it. You can do what you want. It's your stuff. You can do whatever you want with. Right? If you find yourself saying, well, what would your grandfather think? Or what would your mother think? Right? When you start to ask what a deceased person would think about this decision, you need to stop. I'm going to say that again because I hear a lot of people say it. If you find yourself saying, well, what would your father think? Or what would your mother think? You are now justifying an old way of thinking. You, they're not alive anymore. It doesn't matter what they think. I mean, you need to do what you want to do and what the people living in the home want to do. I'm, I'm talking very bluntly, folks, because I see thousands of families struggle with this on a daily basis. And it's really, really important that we don't uh, candy coat these conversations. Right? A lot of times this is the last time you're at home. You need to be, you need to, to speak frankly. All right. Avoid punting. This goes along with the um, guilt. I'm using this picture on purpose. Look at this picture. It is a sofa, a wood sofa that is not very comfortable. And it's often in a room that we're not allowed to go into. Um, I see a lot of times you say, oh, well, don't you want to keep your great grandma's couch? It's been in our family for 80 years. And the next generation is like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm not interested. But yet we feel obligated to say, well, gosh, you know, I've had it for 40 years. Are you sure you don't want to keep it? And then they say, no, I don't want it, mom. I'm good. And then your brain says, well, she just doesn't really understand what she wants yet. So I'll hold on to it for a few more years. And hopefully a few of you are laughing at each other right now because you've had this exact conversation. Right? You do not need to guilt the next generation into keeping an item just because your mom or dad made you keep it, right? If the next generation doesn't want it, they don't want it. Yeah, the best way to find out is to ask. Mm -hmm. Number eight, donate, donate, donate. This is absolutely the best way to get rid of things. And I can talk later about how, where to sell things if you want, but, but the reality is the best thing you can do is donate. I mean, there are many, many people that don't have things. All right? I'm really big into clothes. Donate as many clothes as you can. Um, Dress for Success is a group that I use. Um, that's a group that will take your old clothes and they'll let you, um, you donate them and they will give them to people that are looking for jobs and in interviews. Uh, souls for Souls is a shoe group that'll restore the shoes and put new soles on them and get them to people in third world countries that don't have shoes. Um, Catholic Charities I use a lot. Um, I can tend to do immediate use. Tech for Troops is a good one for the electronics. The old TVs you don't want, it's called Tech for Troops. Um, they will actually pick up your old TVs and they'll recycle, excuse me, they'll recycle them. They have uh, vets that are, you know, retired vets that are looking for jobs and they will actually have them recycle those. There's a lot of things, and this is a very localized uh, group, so I don't have very specific national charities on here because every place is different. I will tell you, I, um, I tend to stay away from retail centers. Mm -hmm. Tech for Troops. Someone, uh, Patty, what is it? Roundsville just asked, what's the name of the tech recycler? Again, it's Tech for Troops. I know there is one in Alexandria. Uh, I can't guarantee for the Maryland side of it. Um, Matt Quinn from Quinn's Auction House, he turned me on to them. I think a lot of you know Matt Quinn, uh, Quinn's Auction House. He has started doing a lot more recycling as well with me down, down the south. We just think it's really important, but the Tech for Troops is a great group. They, they bring in vets and give them jobs and help them recycle it. There's a bunch of really good nonprofits 
what I stay away from, I look for immediate use. I look for groups that are going to give the items away or they're going to sell them really quickly and turn them into things. If it goes on a retail shelf, I try to, I tend to stay away from it. I want it to be Catholic charities is really good, but there's tons of good charities. Just do your, do your homework on charities and make sure that you, uh, you agree with their mission and make sure that they're still doing their mission. I will tell you a lot of the places are open. We assume they're not open because of COVID. Many of them are open, but I will tell you many are not doing pickups anymore. So here's a little hack I do on the donation side. Put a, uh, a cardboard box in your trunk and put your donation items there. Don't do it in, inside your house because then you got to pick that box up and take it to your car. Go ahead and just put that trunk, that box in your trunk. And when that box is full, drive by a donation center and they can get some, a young guy to come in there and pick up the box for you. And that way you're not actually doing the heavy lifting. Because if you fill that box, like the box that's on the screen right now, if that's on the floor in my, in my garage or in my you know, mud room or whatever, I'm not going to pick that up. And so I think it's really important that you put it in the, in the trunk of your car and that's how you just take it straight there. And yeah, you might go every other week, but so what? It gets the items out of your house and you don't have to pick up as much. Be realistic. This is, uh, this is a personal picture for me. Wider circle in Maryland and home stretch in Virginia also accept donations. That's uh, from Susan uh, Rana. Oh, hey, Susan. Uh, wider circle in Maryland and home stretch in Virginia. I don't know these groups. I can't speak to them because I'm not in your region. But look them up. Make sure you, you really like their mission. Um, I think it's really important to match the mission to you because the more you care about the group, the more you're going to give them. Mm -hmm. And don't just throw trash in there. Like, don't put your nasty clothes. I had an old guy that used to work for me. Leroy is an old homeless dude and we were cleaning a lady's house down in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, she said, oh, that's a ratty old sweater. I'll donate it. And he said, ma'am, I don't mean to be rude. He said, I am homeless. I'm not ugly. He goes, I need your good stuff. And we all just kind of laughed. We were like, that's about right, Leroy. <laughs> and he, he really did make us understand. He goes, I need to look good, not bad. He said, I'm trying to get my life together. He's like, don't give me your trash. And remember when you give them trash, you're actually just passing the cost on to the nonprofit. And so you're not actually helping them, you're hurting them. All right, number nine, be realistic. Um, Interfaith Closing Center, I have worked with them before. They've been great. Um, don't be afraid to put your uh, donation groups here in the chat. We can look through them as well. Um, being realistic, this is, I've got, this is actually my closet. Uh, if you look to the left, it's, or excuse me, if you start at the right, with the khakis, that was size 28. Then we got into 30s really quick. Then we got into some 32s. And as you move left, it goes to 34s. And then you get to the end here, it's 36s. All right. I go from size 28 to size 36 in my closet because I have gained a lot of weight. And the reality is over the last 15, 20 years, I've gained that much weight. And I'm still holding on to 28s. I'm holding on to the 28s because I don't want to admit defeat. All right. I actually think I might get back into them again. Is that realistic? No, I'm never going to get back into 28s. I'm never going to get back into 30s. I will gladly say I put this picture up in this, in this presentation two years ago. I finally actually went through. I got rid of everything. I got rid of my 28s, my 30s, and my 32s. And I, I donated them. They're good clothes. And uh, I've, I've got a lot more space in my closet now. It's kind of nice. And it doesn't, I didn't fill it with a bunch. Of, I didn't go out and buy 10 more pairs. Uh, the reality is in this picture, there's 30 pair of pants and only three fit me, which means only 10% of the pants in my closet fit. Most of you have that reality. Um, you also look here, if you see uh, on this picture, all the hangers are pointed in the same direction. All right, I do that every year. How many pair of shoes do I have? That's a great question. Um, gosh, probably like six pair, and I probably wear two of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm a minimalist. I don't really keep much anymore. This job has made me not really like stuff. Um, I like, I mean, I got a bunch of kids too. And so I got to be able to go, go, go. And so I don't really uh, keep a lot of stuff. Um, this is a really important tip here, guys. All the hangers in one area. This may sound ridiculous, but I point all the hangers in one direction. You notice they're all going north. Right? And then when I wear that item, I turn the coat hanger around the other way. And so at the end of the year, I can actually see visually right away which clothes I wore that year. That's what I always do on New Year's Day, believe it or not. I'm, I'm a wild man. I know. 
I like to see at the end of the year what I didn't wear because then two or three shirts, they go to donate. Two or three pair of pants go to donate because I haven't worn them in a year. The reality is I'm not going to wear them again. Right? The other one is um, do a, uh, this is my favorite one, do a fashion show with your grandkids. Put the clothes on. If all the grandkids laugh at it, it's probably time to get rid of it. And if you can't get it on, well, then there you go. It doesn't fit. Time to get rid of it as well. Um, spending a lot of time on being realistic about clothes. What about food? Food's tough. A lot of us come from the last kids of the depression. Um, it's easy to clean through your closet for some people, but yet we've got, we've got food from 1990 in our pantry. We got spices from 1890 in our pantry. Right? Uh, I'm not going to get in the argument of if the expiration date is valid or not. Some people think it's an opinion. Some people think it's a fact. Uh, I tend to believe it's a fact, but I would never win that argument with my mother. Um, what I can tell you is they started putting dates on food in 1984. So if there's no dates on the food whatsoever, that's from 1984, which by the way is more than 35 years ago. Okay. We have, some of you have kids that are, that are older than that. I mean, gosh, most of you have kids that are older than that. So please, please, if it doesn't have a date at all, you know, you can get rid of it. Okay. Don't ever start in the kitchen or the closet when you're downsizing. That's the two, it's number nine on my list on purpose because it's a really difficult thing to talk about. Do not talk about food or clothing in the first day. You'll always fail if you do. All right, I'm saving the best for last. Photos and mail. Photos and mail are tough. Right? Uh, let's talk about uh, mail first. Right? Uh, I'm, especially in your region, all right, paper represents Opportunity, potential, it's potential money, potential letters, which is potential conversation, all right? It's potential, there could be money in those statements that I didn't know about. We always think, um, it's funny, I used to do a lot of hoarding work. The three top places in the country for hoarding are Washington, D.C., metro area, Boston, and San Francisco. The reason are high education, high income. The more educated you're, the people in your city are, the more books and more paper you're going to find. I challenge people to find a more educated town than Washington, D.C., the metro D.C. area, all right? Paper, paper, paper galore in this town because we're all so intelligent. And so we find books, tons of books. Um, and I think I see tons and tons and tons of letters, all right? The reality is, I mean, there's, gosh, there's even potential uh, recipes, family recipes. So you have to go through the paper. But the reality is most of us don't need the paper anymore. Um, so I do, a, I do, I actually say stop it at the source. That's the best thing you could do. So this next holiday season, go through all the catalogs. Now you're going to get more catalogs than you've gotten in a lot of years because we're home for COVID. Immediately call the company, tell them to take it off your list and then tear it up. Right? And I put it in the recycling. Uh, same thing with the banks. You can go to paperless. Um, if you owe somebody money, guess what? They'll find you. I, I wouldn't worry about that. They're going to find you if you owe money. If people owe you money, eh. They're, they're probably not going to find you. Okay. Um, go through a quick thing. You know, that's a great thing to do 10 minutes a night is start going through these piles of paper and just shred them. You got to shred and you got to get rid of it fast, recycle it. Um, it's really important to do the paper. Uh, books are a nightmare. I will, I will, this is not a, uh, this is definitely not a, a popular statement. Uh, but to me, books are trophies. Books are a, are a trophy for a moment in time. That book made you feel good. That book, brought you happiness and joy at a time when you, when you didn't have it. Right? We don't often read the book three or four times over. Sometimes we do, but, but rarely. Um, books just take up space. It's better to donate them. A lot of libraries will still take them. Some won't, but some will. Um, I will tell you a lot of the city, in fact, we just donated uh, about seven boxes of kid books to uh, a local city school that needed the books for their kids to give out to the other kids. So get a little creative on the donation side of that, but Books are, are a challenge. You, you, you can't take them with you and they take up a lot of space. Photos are really, really, really tough. All right. I'm going to tell you this one. Um, if you don't know the name of anybody in that picture, it's okay to let go of it. I'm going to say that again. If you don't know the name of anybody, a lot of times we have the picture because we think someone will. A lot of times you're the last person to actually know who the person is. If you are, the, if you do know who they are, write it down. Sorry, the best thing you can do on this is the three you can go through is landscapes. All right, if there's nobody in 
the picture at all. It's just a land, general land, so it's a picture of the beach. You don't even know which beach, right? And there's no people in it, and there's no way for you to know where it is. You can throw that away. The duplicates, remember back in the 80s, uh, People Drug and CV, it's now CVS. There was People Drug, Fox Photo, One Hour Photo. We, there was tons of them, all right? They gave us doubles. You can get rid of the doubles. So if you just get rid of the doubles, the landscapes, and the people that you have no idea who they are, get rid of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Miss Bell wrote hospitals like children's books off. Yes, get creative on your on your books. Right? Call around and see who wants them. Um, but on the photos, get rid of the duplicates. Get rid of the landscapes and the people you don't know who they are. That's going to knock out at least half of them right there. And your goal should be to get down to at least two boxes, two plastic boxes. Um, and get rid of the shoe boxes. Shoe boxes are just they're going to get damaged. They're not going to make it. Um, I've got a new thing I've started doing is for every grandkid in the family, uh, take a Ziploc uh, gallon size freezer bag and put 10 pictures in there right? for each grandkid, for each great grandkid, or maybe each adult children. Put 10 pictures of your whole life, not just the last 10 years. Right? Um, scan the picture and throw it away. I'm not going to get into scanning, Donna, but you're totally right. Uh, we could spend an hour on pictures. Abs I mean, it's, a, it's such, a, such a big topic. Pictures are what holds most of us back because we feel like we got to go through them all. Scanning is the way to go. Um, personally, I actually own a company that scans pictures. That's called Memories by Matt. Um, so I'm a little biased. <laughs> we do a lot of scanning because it's just such a, a challenge. Um, but please, 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 just, just don't toss all the pictures, but give yourself the time. Because we talked again, we talked about working 10 minutes a night. You can do that with pictures. You can do that with your papers. That can take you through the winter. That can take you right through the winter, right now, if you just do 10 minutes a night. And that starts to slowly give you hope. It lets you know that you're getting things done and it gives you physical space that you can be proud of, right? Um, but what I keep wanting you to do is take the time to tell the stories. The stories are what matters. That little Ziploc bag trick I was telling you about. Put the 10 pictures in there, put some coins, whatever you wanna put in there, a little bit of jewelry, and you've made a little time capsule. But the important thing is you've put the stories on it. You've got to put the story. There was a story from uh, season one of Legacy List where I found this picture of a, of a lady. We always find a picture of her when she was like 18 years old and she's stunning, like drop dead gorgeous. And I knew it was her. It was the 80 year old lady that was standing in front of me. It was clearly her, but she was 18. And I said, whoa, who's this, who's this beautiful girl? And she goes, oh, that's me. And then her granddaughter immediately says, well, who's that guy? She goes, oh, that's Armando. She goes, who is Armando? Armando? She, or Fernando. She goes, who is Fernando? She goes, that's not grandpa. And she goes, I know. She goes, that was Fernando. He was my lover. And then this huge story goes on. And she's like, where did you meet him? And she goes, oh, well, I was, I was a, a PA at, uh, she was a, or a, uh, and a, a teacher, TA at, uh, at um, MIT. And she goes, I was teaching. And she goes, you taught there? She goes, I just thought you were a student. She goes, oh, no, I was actually an art history teacher as well. And so her mom, this her, her mother, or excuse me, the granddaughter and the, the mother, the daughter both found out at that moment that their grandmother taught at MIT. They never knew it, right? And it started off because there was a good looking Spanish guy in the picture. And it's really important for your kids to hear all the stories, not just the ones when you're really old, right? or not really, but when you're sitting there, you know, holding your purse, right? Make sure they see the pictures, share the 10 pictures per kids. I will tell you this year we did it. And uh, I saw lots, I got lots and lots of emails from people uh, from both Hanukkah and Christmas saying, man, it was awesome. Uh, this was the, the hit gift. And it was, it's not a lot of money. It didn't cost any money. You just bought a box of Ziploc bags, but you got to give time to write those stories down. So share those stories. That's really all that matters to me is the stories, right? Our stuff, the challenge is that our stuff causes us stress, right? It stresses us out. It's really never about the stuff, right? It's really about... Believe it or not, it's about the loss of control. Mm -hmm. We're freaking out because we're not in control of everything more. Things are changing, and we have to change with it. And it's really, really hard. And the best way to do that is, is to, if we're going to lose out, right? You want to tell the stories. That's how you stay in control. Right? It's not about the items. It's not about where you're going. It's about being able to tell your narrative and keep going. All right. So how do we get started? You got to find a crowd. Mm -hmm. I want you to go home tonight and find the 10 items you want to talk about, right? And you got to find people that actually want to hear it and then record the stories, right? This was a great story. This lady right here, 
Uh, she's an amazing woman, Lillian Lambert. Uh, she was the first African-American woman to go to Harvard, excuse me, for Harvard uh, Business School. She was the first African woman to get an MBA from Harvard. And I was cleaning her house. And I said, what's the most important item in your house? She said, oh, this well, that's easy. I went out and it was a pump well, basic pump well. I said, what's so important about this? She said, well, when I was a kid, we lived on a, in Virginia on a tobacco farm and I had to walk to the river each day to get water. She said, when we got a pump well, I didn't have to walk. She goes, I finally had time to read. I had time to study. She goes, without this well, I never would have gone to Harvard. Amazing story. She's gone on to do incredible things, but that well goes everywhere with her. No matter where she lives, that well goes. I mean, that is a legacy item. That's the kind of story your family needs to hear, right? Tell the stories, share them, make people listen, okay? All right, this is the last little thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you. These are important. Look at this screen, if you will, all right? These are called conversation starters. A lot of times our kids don't know how to even ask us questions. So I actually give out, I give 10, each Friday I give one of these conversation starters on my social media. And I'm just giving you a couple here to get started. Um, tell the grandkids, who was your childhood best friend? Okay. What was your first job and how much did you make per hour? That's gonna blow their mind, how much you made per hour and the job. Usually those jobs don't exist anymore. Um, where was your first vacation and how did you get there? They're not gonna believe that you drove cross country in a, a little car. Uh, what was your first car? This is always a great one. And who is your first love? If it wasn't grandma or grandpa, that always blows them away. Um, I've got tons of these conversation stars. You can get them on my website, uh, mylegacylist.com. If you do go to mylegacylist.com, there's tons of these conversation starters. Lots of other tips of the trade if you need to. If you're, if you're just stuck and you don't know where to start. But I want you to know you can do this. All right? You absolutely, if you sign up for my, uh, my mailing list, you get all the, you get all 10 conversation starters. Um, this is not as hard as you think. You just got to get started 10, 15 minutes a night. That's it. And start to tell the stories. If you tell those stories, I promise you the stress will go away. All right. I think we got a few minutes for questions if there are any. Boy, I hope you guys were listening. I hope I didn't... Uh... Just do that by myself. <laughs> what about the thing? Okay, thank you. What about the things you think can be sold? All right. This is tough. I'm going to set your expectations really low. All right. Most of us think, um, okay, is Memories by Matt? Yes, yeah, still an active company. Yeah, go to, um, go to mylegacylist.com. We, if we'll send you a box, you put all the pictures in there and we, we scan it for you. And we send it back to you on a, uh, on a uh, little disk drive or put it on the cloud. Um, 10 minutes seems a little, little like not a lot for some people. I get that. The problem is 10 minutes turns into two hours real quick. All right. So if you guys find a happy medium 30 minutes, fine. Keep it under an hour. All right. That's what's really important to me. Keep it under an hour. Oh, these are some great questions. How do I find an honest, high quality organizer to help with this project? What should it cost? Um, I, I'm gonna give you two websites, napo.net and nasm.org. N-A-S-M-M, that's the National Association of Senior Move Managers. And napo, napo.net. I mean, that's the professional organizers, or you can just go to my website, mylegacylist.com, and we'll connect you with somebody locally, all right? Any of those three. Um, it's really, really important, all right, that when she asked, how do I find a trustworthy one? If they're a member of either NAPO or NASM, they have gone through some really, in, you know, crucial training, specifically on ethics and morals. Um, and, and they're gonna have different licensing under there. So make sure they're licensed. And that goes into the urge of having things appraised. All right, and we're gonna go from appraisal to sell. I don't wanna forget either one of those. Um, I'm gonna be honest, most of your items don't really need to be appraised, all right? First thing you wanna do is you wanna go online to see how they can be sold, where they've been sold. I don't go on eBay that much because eBay is, is too technical nowadays. I go on two websites and I'll put these again in the chat here. Uh, ebth.com and maxsold.com. These are the two sites that I use. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever. I do know the people that run both. Um, those are national 
online auction houses. And you can see what these items sold for. And this is really important. What did they sell for? It doesn't mean it's what they're worth. Something is only worth what an individual third party is willing to give you for it. It doesn't matter what you think it's worth or what, it, uh, what you paid for it. And appraisals, uh, an independent appraiser is going to cost you usually around 250 bucks just to get them out there to look at an item. And then they're going to tell you what it cost. Right? Um, uh, websites are not coming up. Sorry. Okay. Uh, EBTH, it's called Everything But The House, EBTH, and Max Sold, M-A-X-S-O-L-D.com. That's a good place just to see what they've sold for. Again, I want to set your expectations really low. Items are not going to sell for as much as you paid for them or as much as your grandfather or father told you it was worth. Um, here's a news flash. Whatever your dad told you it was worth, it's probably not. Go figure. A dad told you something funny. Oh, good. Connor's uh, taping them in for us. Thank you. Um, our dads tend to exaggerate things. I'm a dad. I do it all the time, too, apparently. You know, not ever, I had a lady that said, oh, my great-grandfather carved this on the Mayflower. And as I, got, as I got into it, I was like, we're missing about 100 years. Mathematically, that doesn't work out. Uh, and when we flipped it over, it said Haverty's. Right? Just because, but the family folklore was that this thing was on the, on the Mayflower for 300 years ago or whatever, and it was, it was only about 40 years old. We believe what our family tells us, and we skew the values. Um, most things are not worth what you think they are. I want to really encourage you. Uh, I'm actually writing a book about this right now for AARP. Uh, the book will come out next year. Uh, it's called uh, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff. And it's about all these techniques of how to sell things. At the end of the day, you've already made the decision to get rid of it, right? So the dollar amount shouldn't really matter, right? You, you are, if you say, oh, well, it's only, if I can't get five grand for it, I'm not going to sell it. Well, you already said you didn't want it. So remember that. Um, places, an appraiser will tell you if it's really valuable, right? And so if you don't know, it's worth it. It gives you the insurance of knowing what it's there for. Appraiser should not sell it for you. The appraiser should not be the person selling it, and they absolutely should not be the person buying it. Um, I do not believe in yard sales. I do not believe in local estate sales where it's just in your house. The only value in having a local estate sale in your house is if you need help selling your house. <laughs> you need people to see it because the reality is, um, oh, gold coins, silver, I'm saying, proof sets. I've been able to do what they're worth. I want to be sure I don't get cheated if I trade them in. Um, Jill, if you want to email me, uh, go to the mylegacylist.com. Uh, I'll connect you with a good, there's a good coin guy up there that's independent. You want an independent coin dealer that's going to appraise them. Those sets, the proof sets are what I'm really concerned about. Please don't go take them to a, just a corner little coin store. You don't want to do that. Um, coins, coins and stamps hold their value, believe it or not. Baseball cards do as well. Um, it's the, the, what you really want to struggle with is the furniture. The dining room furniture has no value. Um, where, you know, two generations ago, we would fight over who got to keep the China cabinet. And now we fight over who has to take it because nobody wants it. That brown furniture is really difficult to sell. Your mid-modern furniture sells well. The best way to sell is through an online auction. If your local auctioneer also does an online auction, then I would work with them. They're going to take between 30 and 40% though, because they're marketing it. And that's okay. The more they market it, the higher that price is going to go. You don't want one person interested in your item. You want two. Because if one person is interested, he'll say, I'll give you a hundred bucks and you kind of have to take it. If you have two people interested, now that's how the price goes up. All right. So you really, really want to get an online auction on your items. And I, and I work with a bunch, both regionally and nationally. I do work with Matt Quinn a lot where you guys are. Uh, he's in North Virginia, but he does an online auction and a physical auction. Um, maybe he's a great example. Like I met, the Quins because we had a bunch of Asian art and he, he has an expert on that. Uh, we had some African American art that he had an expert on. So you want to get, a lot of times your auction houses will have experts that'll be able to appraise it for you instead of, um, instead of actually having to pay an independent appraiser, right? There's three levels of appraisers. You can see them on the uh, National Association of Appraisers, sorry, National Association of Appraisers. Um, there's three different levels. And when you go through those levels, you'll see, yep, Potomac Auctions and Alexander's are really good. They are very good. They're a high-end group. 
Um, they're really high in Potomac's great. I've worked with them on many different houses. Um, those are your two best up there, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I mean, what I love about Quinn's is they, they'll tell you like, don't sell it with me. I'm not the guy to sell it. In fact, I've seen a lot of times where Quinn will send something to Potomac because Potomac has a better audience for that item. And so they want you to maximize your dollar. So either one of those Quinn's or Potomac's you're good. Um, you know, and EBTH is good. Max sold is good. Um, just, I really want to stress more, like be realistic with what your items are worth. Um, don't be afraid to have someone from one of those companies just come look at the entire house. They'll tell you right away. Um, but you know, average price for the, if, once the kids have taken the good stuff out of the house, there's usually not a whole lot of, a whole lot of money. Um, yeah, uh, go to the mylegacylist.com and, and some of those people are on there. If they're not, I can just email me on there and we'll, we'll, we'll have someone connect you with the right people locally. Um, you know, one good thing about your region, um, yeah, I mean, Matt Quinn, I, look, I know Matt really well. We're good friends. Um, in fact, we've been on each other's TV shows <laughs> as well. Um, auction houses, like they need, like they have to have good reviews. If, if, if they screw you over, and do a bad job for you, they're out of this, like forever. So they're not, the bigger the auction house, the more reliable they often are because they can't, they can't afford to have any type of negativity because they'll be out of business if they do. Uh, it's the upstarts that you don't know anything about, that's the ones I'd be concerned about. Doesn't mean they're not good. Um, Caring Transitions is actually a, a downsizing company. They do have an auction site that I hear is doing pretty well. Caring Transition, I have not worked with them, but I've heard um, in multiple parts of the country, they, they do okay. Um, just ask a lot of questions, lots of questions. And it's okay to go on my website. We're, we're, we're doing a lot of articles on this topic, tons. Um, yeah, Potomac, that's a great one. Um, we're, if you go to mylegacylist.com, we'll connect you with a bunch. Uh, I'm working on this for ARP as well on a book. I mean, we'll have a whole lot of, up. there's a lot of articles I've written online about it as well. Don't be afraid to do it. All right. Um, Thank you, Susan. Um, I think I've got any other questions. I think we helped on that. Guys, I hope it helped. I want you to not be scared about this. Just get started. 10, 20, 30 minutes. That's it. But if the 30 minutes goes well, don't, don't immediately say, let's do two hours. All right. This is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. All right. Marathon, not a sprint. And obviously reach out to the people at Kensington. They <laughs> you know the people that are sponsoring this class today. I mean, they've gone out of their way to, help you, you know, find me and give you the information. Like if you're thinking of moving there, like definitely, definitely call them and they will have a lot of these contacts as well. Um, they're not about just trying to move you in there. I mean, they're, they want to have, they want you to live there for a long time. So they're going to have resources for you to help you. Um, do not be afraid to reach out to them. They, they know we, that's how they met me. We met at a, at an industry event, I think actually at Quinn's auction house, believe it or not. So do not be afraid to reach out to whoever your moving coordinator is because the more they're going to have all the same contacts that I'm going to have, but they might even have some that I don't know about because it's local, especially as they open up the newest, uh, the newest location. Is somebody from the Kensington on that can, uh, maybe Susan or uh, is someone else that could talk about that? There we go. Yeah, I'm here. It's Kitty. Um, yeah, Kitty, they can reach out to you guys, right? And ask some of these questions. Absolutely. And we play nicely in the sandbox. So if the Kensington is not a good fit, if you're looking for senior living, we will help you with, um, you know, choosing another community. Mm -hmm. um, but we are so happy that you were here today with us, Matt. I learned more um, than I've known. And I did just downsize from a five bedroom house. 20 years uh, to a two bedroom. And I might have a small little storage unit that I'm working on, but. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to do a storage unit. I just got too much stuff, man. We're going, <laughs> uh, we're going from a 3,300 square foot home to a 2,200 square foot home and from three kids to seven kids. So I'm going to, oh, it's wow. going to be a house full of kids, man, with no stuff. Right. Well, um, we, the Kensington, we, all three communities have robust, um, websites with events i'm sorry events on our website so we'll hope everyone today will take a look and see if um there's anything else that you're interested in we're trying to do webinars 
and we'd love to have Matt back. Um, if you have any legacy stories for him, please go to his website. It would be really fun if you were on his TV show. Hey, Kitty, thank you. Hey, I totally forgot. We are always casting for the show. If you, if you or someone in your family wants to be on the show, we've finished season two, but we're already casting for season three for next year. So definitely go to mylegacylist.com, and there's a place to actually sign up for the show right there. Yeah, Thank you. If, if it's not you, it might be your neighbor or your um, friend. So it's a great show. It's really fun. So if there are no more questions, Connor, do you see any more from Matt? Nope, all set. Okay.